Welcome to the show. Happy, happy Friday. I know y'all are ready for the weekend, but hopefully we can ring it in with this show. Today we got a lot to unpack. We're going to be talking about Tucker Carlson, who's now in his travel vlogger influencer era, I guess, after his trip to uh, Moscow. And he's posting all these videos of him traveling and eating McDonald's and going to subway stations. We'll talk about the underlying messaging in those videos. Plus, Chicago mayor keeps fumbling the ball any chance he gets the opportunity. We'll unpack that. If you're a black person and you thought, the Democrats are going to help me, you know, this next year around, they're coming at you with a new committee of sorts, and it is a hip hop task force. I am, in fact, not joking. Plus, Rachel Dolezal is now back in the news, not because she is pretending to be black. She is pretending to be a good teacher whilst doing OnlyFans on the side. Uh, I'm also not joking about that. Plus, with the influx of illegal immigration that's happening at the U.S. border, we're now having migrant madness happening in the United States of America, with several of them deciding to commit crimes. We know it's not all of them, but one is too many. Before we get into all that, let me introduce Taylor. Taylor in Nashville. Hey, uh, but yeah, buckle up, guys. This is our document looks very long with the amount of links that we have for stories that we're getting to today. So it should be a lot. But also the way that you add little uh, quips to each introduction of a story, I feel like you're borderline uh, late night monologuing here. So <laughs> I think we need to punch that up a little bit because they're not much competition these days. I think you could smoke them and actually have us uh, slap in our knee. Yeah, we'll work on that. I think I could translate uh, today's modern news for Gen Z. For those of you who are too bored to listen to it on Fox or CNN, you girl right here. She's got you. Now, let's talk all things Tucker Carlson. You know that he was recently in Russia. He was there to interview Vladimir Putin. And as I said, he's in his influencer travel vlogger era because he's apparently traveled all around Moscow, sort of filming these videos of what he's seeing within the city. He's famously now come out and said that Moscow was beautiful uh, and more pristine than any city that he has seen in the United States of America. And some people are taking kindly to that, saying that the U.S. could learn some things from Russia and start sort of emulating them here in our modern cities because our metropolitan areas are worse for the wear. Uh, we've got people fighting in the streets, doing fentanyl in the streets, throwing excrement at each other, just crazy stuff. I can't even imagine going on a New York subway these days. And it's seemingly in Moscow, things look wholly different. Others are criticizing Tucker and saying that he's not really showing a clear picture of what it's actually like to live in Russia. We're going to unpack that today. But first, let's watch some of his clips. Uh, here is him going to the subway station and comparing it to that of the U.S. There's no graffiti. There's no filth. There's no foul smells. There are no bums or drug addicts or rapists or people waiting to push you onto the train tracks and kill you. No, it's perfectly clean and orderly. And how do you explain that? We're not even going to guess. That's not our job. We're only gonna ask the question. 
And if your response is to shout at us slogans dumber than the slogans we used to call Soviet and mock, that's not really an answer. How does Russia, a country we're told is a gas station with nuclear weapons, have a subway station that normal people use to get to work and home every single day that's nicer than anything in our country? We're not gonna get, we're not gonna speculate. We're just gonna raise the question and wait for someone in charge to give us an answer. What is the answer? So we'll stop the lecture and let you take a look for yourself at what the Kievskaya metro station in Moscow, Russia looks like today, February 2024, in the middle of a war. Here it is. Now, I'm not gonna lie, Vladimir ate, he might have ate that one little thing. He might have ate up that one little thing. <laughs> the subway does look good, right? Okay. And you know, the New York subway is probably never gonna look like this unless we get a real, real change of leadership in power uh, in that city. I don't know a, a single bit of American you know, public transportation infrastructure that really looks like this and is kept this pristine. But mind you, you know, we got a lot of people in the, U in the U.S. of A. Uh, running in throughout here. And while I think we do need a resurgence of law and order, uh, I'll be the first to raise my hand for that. We are looking at a little bit, you know, of a difference in culture and demographic and other things going on. But you know what? I think this this video makes a valid point. You can look at these two places and go, you know what? At, at the very least, we can acknowledge that there is a problem within our country. And we're probably not handling it in the proper way. And we know that with the defund the police movement, the lost uh, morale when it comes to law enforcement, the just influx of illegal immigration, of drugs, of homelessness, that there are things in the United States that we could most definitely do better with. And especially since we're paying all these taxes to the government, we should expect something in return. And maybe that is a cleanly subway and, and just efficient, clean public transportation where you don't have to worry about being assaulted or food being all over the ground or a rat running up your pant leg. <laughs> and it's just crazy that in a, a, a place like the United States, we continuously have to deal with this as citizens, even though I think most of us are paying our taxes right on time uh, when that time of year comes around, which is right now, tears <laughs> trickling down my face as I think about it. <laughs> yeah, and we'd like to see those tax dollars make uh, good public transportation for us, right? And I think you're right. In a vacuum, this is a very big indictment on the public transportation state in American cities. And if you get on social media for any amount of time, you're going to see clips of crazy things happening in the subway, people getting robbed or mugged, people even you'll see headlines of people getting pushed into the way of them, uh, of oncoming trains by uh, deranged people. Yep. You'll see deranged people disturbing other people on the, the subways. Our subways look dirtier. Uh, so there is a valid point to be made there. But the question for me becomes like, is that all that you're trying to do is put an indictment on the state of American subway systems by comparing them to Russia's right now? Or are you trying to make a broader point or, or uh, create a broader narrative that is made to insinuate that Russia is therefore because of this difference that you were able to find uh, is a better country than the United States, a better run country than, exactly. than the United States. Uh, is it a better place to live than the United States because of uh, just, just this isolated thing? And it's interesting also that he like adds the classical music on top of it, showcases the art in there, which is pretty art, but it's also kind of I'm pretty sure Soviet propaganda art. And there's also something to be said for the fact that uh, the cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow are clean and well run. But if you go out into the countryside of Russia, it's not the same picture. It's not the same uh, veneer or image of prosperity that you'll see. And even in North Korea, they have 
beautiful train stations that they let journalists uh, walk around in to try to color the perception of their country. And you, as a journalist, you want to say, yeah, if there's a point to be made that uh, Amer America's subway systems are in disarray, then let's make that point. But you can do that without also lending credence to a country's narrative that is trying to paint of itself. Yeah, so. and, and he is getting called on that more and more now as these videos come out. He filmed this video in a supermarket and a lot of people initially having seen it are going, oh my gosh, Russian prices are so much better than the U.S. What's going on? How how are we living uh, you know, in squalor here in the U.S. living paycheck to paycheck when these are the prices in Russia? Let's unpack it after you watch what Tucker posted. I went from amused to legitimately angry. Um, so we were guessing what this would cost. Everybody hears from the United States buys groceries and we didn't pay any attention to cost as we were just putting in the car what we would actually eat over a week. And we all came in around 400 bucks, about 400 bucks. Um, it was $104 US here. And that's when you start to realize that ideology maybe doesn't matter as much as you thought, corruption. If you take people's standard of living and you tank it through filth and crime and inflation, and they literally can't buy the groceries they want, at that point, maybe it matters less what you say or whether you're a good person or a bad person. You're wrecking people's lives in their country. And that's what our leaders have done to us. So let's pause there. Uh, you know, I can see the point that he's trying to make that, you know, if you have a good standard of living, maybe it matters less what your political leaders are doing or whether or not they're corrupt. I don't know that I agree with that. I think ideology and corruption still very much matters. And if you're looking at Russia and Vladimir Putin, you got a lot of corruption and bad ideology happening there. Plus, I think Tucker is failing to account for the fact that right. uh, his there money his money is going to do better for him in Russia than the average citizen living in Russia is, you know, it's going to do for them. I believe somebody pointed out that what he paid for those groceries is one tenth of what the average Russian is making. But of course, Tucker has a lot of money. And if you transfer that over to another country and go shopping there, you're going to get more bang for your buck than you would get in the United States. So it's not the most fair comparison in the world to make, especially when you couple that with the idea that corruption and ideology should matter less. Now, I understand what he's saying. If you're an American and you're no longer living paycheck to paycheck, you're flourishing, you can buy what you want at the grocery store, you have all your amenities, your, your rent is not too high. If all of these things are going well for you, it sort of matters less uh, what your leadership is doing because you feel as though you're being taken care of. But I'm not sure that that's the proper comparison to make, especially when now uh, we have the news after all these like travel vlog videos came out. Uh, Alexei Navalny, who is the leading uh, oppositional voice to Vladimir Putin, he's now dead. Uh, so it, it seems as though he was killed while being incarcerated. And this has not been the first attempt on his life. There was an attempt on his life in 2020 as he was speaking out against the Kremlin and the Russian government where uh, he was poisoned with a neurotoxin. He ended up surviving that uh, in Germany, came back to Russia, was arrested, and he has now died. Now, he was seemingly in good health, although he was being improperly treated uh, during his incarceration, but he supposedly just collapsed whilst out on a walk and is now done. Uh, so we can speculate as to how the leading oppositional voice in your uh, country has now uh, died and whether or not that is an assassination. So I do think that maybe corruption matters. And now a ton of people in Russia have been taking into to the streets to protest and mourn the life of Alexei Navalny, and they're being arrested for being in the streets and uh, mourning him. So I think that matters. And maybe your Russian groceries were $100 USD, but your free speech and your ability to speak out in opposition to your government matters a little bit, Tucker. <laughs> Just a bit, just a wee bit. <laughs> you mean you wouldn't trade your civil liberties for cheaper groceries, Amala? What are you crazy? Right. It's really giving. Uh, remember when there was all that outrage over 
influencers from TikTok who were brought over by Xi'an to tour their mm-hmm. factories in China. And they were like, oh, look, everything's so well run. Look at this modern technology that they have. Here's a worker. They seem to be treated well. And you're kind of shilling for what is known to be an exploitative corporation that, you know, doesn't follow great human rights practices or have great record on that. And you can turn a blind eye to that because you're being treated well or because apparently you have some kind of vested interest in promoting a certain narrative about this country. And I don't think Tucker is like a Russian agent or propagandist or anything. I mean, he's kind of acting in the role of a Russian propagandist to some degree in this stuff. You could say that. But I don't know. I don't know what his motive is in this. But it does make you question, like, just what what are you getting at here? What is animating this effort to promote Russia. I know that Tucker is very much like a populist and and very nationalistic. And uh, I think he probably sees like Vladimir Putin and Russia as a more like nationalist sort of state uh, that isn't bogged down by all this uh, bureaucratic stuff that comes along with having things like civil liberties and due process and our system. And there's, to be fair, there's a lot of things to be frustrated about in our current American political landscape that Tucker is pointing to. But it just seems like the the way in which he's presenting Russia as the paragon of proper political governance or whatever is lacking in context, to say the least. Yes. And speaking of lacking of context, there's this video (laughs) that he did going to a grocery store, I believe. You guys can check it out and see if this at all looks familiar to the U.S. to you in any way, shape or form. All right. Here we go. So I guess you put in 10 rubles here and you get it back when you put the cart back. So it's free, but there's an incentive to return it and not just bring it to your homeless encampment. Okay. All right. I'm like, has dude ever been to Aldi before? (laughs) (laughs) We do have this in the United States where you can put a quarter into your shopping cart to get it out. And uh, you have to, you know, take the quarter out once you return the shopping cart and all that. I just thought it was so funny that nobody, uh, nobody within his team told him, hey, Tucker, we do actually have this in the great U.S. of A. So that is so funny. That's a great point. It's one thing for him not to be aware, but for no one on his entire team, because I saw people on Twitter who were like, yeah, this is like basically every grocery store in Europe. And yeah, I've definitely seen this in my local Aldi. But of course, Aldi's like a budget store. So maybe it stands a reason that Tucker wouldn't go there. But how could at least nobody in his team say, hey, maybe let's not use this as this uh, big gotcha to America whenever you literally have the same thing here? Yeah, a little bit of the fumbling of the ball there. A little little fumbling. Speaking of fumbling the ball, though, we're going to get into some U.S.-based news now. For those of you in Chicago, how are you guys feeling about your mayor, uh, Mr. Brandon Johnson? Because he's had uh, an interesting week in the news. For those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, the city of Chicago uses a technology known as shot spotter and what it is is uh, essentially technology that's capable of knowing when shot gu- shot uh, gunshots are happening within the city and alerting law enforcement to the location of those gunshots and it essentially just alerts and directs cops to where the gunshots were heard through this technology i believe it has a 97% accuracy and they were going to contract with ShotSpotter in Chicago for an extra six months and then cut their contract. Now, here is the Chicago mayor announcing this. Let's see what he has to say. The campaign promise fulfilled. Thank mayor you. Brandon Johnson is ending the city's use of the controversial gunfire <laughs> surveillance system known as ShotSpotter. The city's contract with the company behind ShotSpotter expires on Friday, and the police will stop using the technology September 22nd, about a month after the Democratic National Convention. A city statement said, Moving forward, Chicago will deploy its resources on the most effective strategies and tactics proven to accelerate the current downward trend in violent crime. For years, grassroots organizations targeted ShotSpotter. The campaign promised... Okay, so you might be wondering, what's wrong with this? They say they're going to discontinue the contract, they're going to add maybe another six months onto it, and they're going to get rid of this company. The mayor of Chicago announced this before having actually signed the deal with ShotSpotter. So this company hears that they're going to get, you know, 
outed. They're going to be done within six months. And then they're, they're like, okay, we're not going to stick around for the six months. We're just going to go ahead and end our contract with the city of Chicago now. So now the city of Chicago does not have this technology for the next six months. And I'm not quite understanding why they're getting rid of it, considering what I read up about ShotSpotter says that they have a 97 or, or around there a percentage of accuracy when it comes to identifying gunshots and alerting police to their location. And we all know Chicago has a major problem with gun violence, even if they claim that it is on the downtrend. Why you would no longer want this technology in your city just really dumbfounds me, considering that this is seemingly an ongoing problem. And if you can utilize a technology that is only going to advance and get better in order to solve your problem, identify both victims and perpetrators, I'm not sure why you would go about getting rid of said technology. But we all know that Chicago has a long history of just messing up uh, wherever they can. They did it with Lori Lightfoot, and now they're doing it with Brandon Johnson, who decided to announce this to the world before he had even sat down with the company to actually officiate the deal. <laughs> it's like such a Michael Scott thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a Michael Scott thing to do to announce something like this before you've actually signed the deal with the company and good on the company uh, for being like, you know what, if you are really going to do this, we're, we're going to get out. I do prefer that they stay so that you can help people who are dealing with what is a very rampant problem in the city of Chicago. But my goodness, the amount of just lunacy in our leadership is dumbfounding. Ugh, to just really fumble this hard is crazy. It is. And the way that they start this segment, new segment, by saying campaign promise fulfilled as this like cheerful tone. And the campaign promise that he made was to make it more difficult to locate gunshots in the city. And so it's just like I it's tough to feel bad for the city of Chicago when, when you replace Lori Lightfoot and her disastrous policies with uh, policies like this. And I just can't help but thinking about um, th this recent news that we've seen out of El Salvador with their new president having cracked down on crime. It went from the absolute most dangerous country in the Western Hemisphere or maybe even the world to having the lowest murder rate in the Western Hemisphere in just a couple of years of him in power. And they did so by doing what? Incarcerating criminals, people who are uh, perpetrating crimes. And it's not complicated. They're saying, we're gonna reallocate resources to develop strategies in order to continue the downward trajectory that we're finding with uh, the the crime rate and the shooting rate in our city. It's, it's not that complicated, man. Like doing stuff like taking away this technology is moving you in the opposite direction of making the city safer. Yep, and you know who it's going to affect? Black people in this age of Black Lives Matter and we should be protecting black people and, and doing the, the best we can for their lives. Let's get rid of the technology that is helping us to identify where uh, gunshot wound victims are and where those perpetrators are. It's absolutely ridiculous. And you know what? I, I, I will say Democrats in Congress, they are doing something for black people. And if you were wondering what that was, no, it's not Joe Biden going to visit a black family with a father and two sons and bringing fried chicken and sitting down with them for dinner. Although that did happen and that video exists on the internet for your viewing pleasure. It's instead a new hip hop tax force that is being brought about to ensure racial equity. And again, I am not joking. They are prescribing for black people fried chicken and hip hop. Let's watch. Hip hop is not just music. It's not just an art form. It's a culture with a multi-billion dollar economy, but we haven't harnessed the power of it yet to make transformative change in legislation. The Black Music Action Coalition is an advocacy organization that's committed to utilizing the cultural capital of black music to influence the music industry and greater society on the issues of racial justice and equity through policy. So how exactly is that possible? That hip hop is going to do anything for racial equity? Not that we want uh, racial equity to be our goal. We all know that that is an exercise in futility, that it's not going to lead about great outcomes. But how demeaning is it 
to be a black person, listening to people who are meant to represent you say that they're going to do it through the power of hip hop. <laughs> and I say this as somebody who is a fan of hip hop, right? I listen to rap music, you know, I, I, I love certain hip hop artists, but to know that your tax dollars are being spent this way and that this is the way that even your black representatives view the black community is astounding to me. And please, somebody write down a plan as to how hip hop and music in any way, shape or form is going to, you know, move forward a, a message of of equity and do anything for the black community because I'm having trouble understanding and virtually every article that I read on this is not capable of detailing how exactly this works. It feels like pandering. It feels like you have reduced black people down to the music that not all of them listen to, but some of them listen to and said, you know, here's this little nugget that we're going to give you guys to show you that we truly understand your people. Don't you guys love Nicki Minaj? Don't you love Cardi B? Don't you love Kanye? <laughs> And people are spending their time, like your representatives are getting together to meet for this hip hop task force. That's how they're, they're doing press conferences about their work on the hip hop task force. This is quite literally something out of South Park. Uh, and we're watching it with our very own two eyes and hearing it with our own two ears. <laughs> Gosh. And you just know the people behind this task force are probably among them are some white Karens who would be so offended if you ever intimated any sort of stereotype around African-Americans in conversation. The uh, comedian makes a joke to the effect of uh, any stereotypes. They would be up in arms. But then so they're so lacking in self-awareness that they'll create this whole hip hop task force. It reminds me of one very recently we saw. Joe Biden sit down with uh, some African-American young men, talk basketball with them and enjoy a bucket of fried chicken with yes. them uh, as a PR move. And even before that, I don't remember if it was to support the vaccine or promote the vaccine in uh, in black communities or whatever. But there, you remember this music video where there's like people twerking mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of like stereotypical crazy behavior going on. But it was in service of some government message like this. Yes, it was. I think it was um, a message about if you either if you don't vote, you don't get to uh, have oh, yeah, sex. No voting, no. Yes, no voting, no V U C K I N G. That was the video that was created. And I believe mm. it was created by an organization that was supported or endorsed by the Obamas. Uh, and that was to tell black people that if you don't vote, uh, if, or if, you're, if your significant other doesn't vote, you should not have sex with them. So when we think about black people in the United States of America, uh, their major motivations are fried chicken, basketball, hip hop, and sex. <laughs> I can't make this up, guys. You cannot make this up. Now, speaking of hip hop, Kanye West is back in the news as he is every month or so now, it seems. He released a new album called Vultures uh, with Ty Dolla Sign. And I did listen to this album on Spotify. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I didn't really think anything of it. He does make several remarks in the album about the accusation of being an anti-Semite anti and sort of pushing back on that accusation. Now, it doesn't matter how you feel about Kanye's comments, really. You have the choice of whether or not you listen to his music. Many are choosing not to. Many are choosing to. Now, in the wake of him releasing this new album, Vultures, tons of different platforms for music were deciding whether or not we keep Kanye on, whether or not we take him off. Apple Music decided to take his album off, and then that created such an uproar, it seems that they put it back on, allegedly. I don't know what the inner workings of them removing it and placing it back on at a lower level were, but that's exactly what happened. You're hearing all of these uh, people who review music and revere hip hop saying that because of Kanye's comments, they're, they're not gonna listen to his album, they're not gonna review what he has to say, and you know what? I think we should just allow 
Kanye or Ye or whatever he's going by now to make his music, put it out to the world, and people who want to listen to it can listen to it. That's the principle that I live by. I understand that these companies have every right to platform or deplatform whoever it is that they want to. And if Kanye happens to be deplatformed, he just has to have alternatives. But guess what? It's one of the most listened to albums uh, right now. I think he deceited Taylor Swift on Spotify, which is just an amazing thing considering his past with Taylor Swift and all the drama that they've had, but people want to listen to it. So as a company, even if you're not going based on principles, think of the, you know, the revenue that you could receive from uh, putting Kanye's album on. If that's the way we're going to view everything these days through the lens of profit since nobody seemingly has principles. If you want to listen to Kanye, listen to Kanye. If you don't, then just don't do it. You shouldn't take away other people's ability or opportunity to listen to something that they want to hear. And guaranteed, Kanye is going to go on and continue to have a very fruitful career. And it's interesting because despite what he's said in the public or how you feel about it, I don't think anybody can deny his artistic ability and the influence that he himself has had on hip hop. Honestly, the Democrats should be hitting him up to be a member of the hip hop task force. (laughs) (laughs) That would be something. Hit up Kanye and make him uh, the leader of the uh, of the hip hop task force. They would never. But yeah, he's had an influence. People want to listen to him. Allow them to do that. Don't use your own lens that you're looking at the world through to decide what is available to the public. And, yeah. you know, if they continue to do this, cancel your cancel your opera music subscription and no longer patronize the businesses who are telling you that they don't trust you to make choices as a consumer and that they have to police the products that are offered to you because that's ridiculous and it was just really funny on social media watching a lot of the response to kanye's album from both the music media and uh individuals posting about it was it was kind of almost a joke that people were like i'm not supposed to say i like this but this album kind of slaps you mm-hmm. know? <laughs> that was the general uh vibe i'm getting and you're right i mean people are going out of their way to stream this album to the effect to to such the extent that it rose to the number one spot on Apple Music. And that says something. And I think it does behoove Apple to just let it let it roll. And I'm glad that I guess they reverse course on taking the album down. But I think this might be too like sort of a transitional step for Kanye a little to edge his way back into uh, center stage in the culture a little bit. He, he was sort of a pariah there for a minute, uh, unmentionable banned from every platform and uh, just looked like he was dead in the water, but his uh, talent is not being held down evidently. And uh, as, as, as he's maybe able to keep his worst angels in check a little bit and able to let his artistry shine, I think maybe we'll see uh, his career take a, a little bit more of a recovery, um, but that remains to be seen. Yeah, Kanye's gonna be fine. Kanye is 100% going to be fine because when you try to do like this sort of corporate assassination, which was what they attempted to do with him, of all these different corporations going and canceling his deals, taking him off of platforms, uh, Balenciaga getting rid of the deal that they had with him, all the things that happened with Yeezy and all this stuff, the general public didn't care. I don't think, uh, you know, his main demographic who listened to his music really cared at all. If anything, they were pretty adamant about separating the art and the artists. The people who were mad at Kanye were the people who were never listening to him in the first Mm. place. And that's the thing about being uncancelable to some extent is that when you have an audience that knows you and knows who you are, they're going to remain when external forces try to come and attack you. And you'll see that that rebound was swift with Kanye. Now, their messages might not have been comparable, but look at what happened with J.K. Rowling, right? She comes out and she makes a statement that people really did not like. The world comes after her. All these corporate outlets are trying to attack her cancel her deals, stop her from being present uh, on any sort of projects 
that revolve around something that she created. And because a very deep core part of her audience knows exactly who she is, knows her background and stood by her, she's uncancelable. There's nothing that's going to happen. And she continues to laugh all the way to the bank. Now, arguably, Kanye took an even more like massive hit, I think, financially than J.K. Rowling did in the wake of her statements. But was that core audience there? Yep. Do they continue to be there? Yep. And that's something about authenticity. When you remain authentic in what it is you truly think in a time where intolerance is at its peak, at least, you know, the very few people who can recognize that will be there for you. Uh when everything is is being challenged and you're losing deals or whatever. And again, I'm not making statements about what Kanye said. It's just a fact that I think his success is going to endure because he really doesn't care. I think uh, his Super Bowl ad was one of the most successful Super Bowl ads to ever air uh, with what he did. And that was just him talking to an iPhone (laughs) and posting that during the Super Bowl and having that be his commercial. So there's something enduring there, whether or not people want to like completely discount him and and discredit him. There's something there that people are seeing and you guys can decide what that is. To your point, in his own words, Kanye wrote in the lyrics of Burn, which is one of the more popular tracks of this new mm-hmm. album, I burned eight billion to take off my chains. So I don't know that he actually burned eight billion dollars worth of net worth, but mm-hmm. I think that probably alludes to this idea that, yeah, it cost me something yep. to be my true self or whatever, but I'm still coming at you with my authenticity, with my artistry, even though it cost me something and I'm still here. So that's an interesting Uh, lyric uh, that substantiated exactly what you were saying. Indeed it is. Now, speaking out of a lack of authenticity, (laughs) interesting segue, we're going to get into (laughs) Rachel Levine here, uh, Secretary of Health. uh, Assistant Secretary of Health, I think is the the title for... Assistant to the Secretary of Health? (laughs) (laughs) Something like that. Uh, Here's the message uh, that Rachel Levine has for the United States involving climate change and its effect on black people. Hello. I'm Admiral Rachel Levine. This Black History Month, I'm pleased to partner with OMH in advancing better health through better understanding for black communities. Climate change is having a disproportionate effect on the physical and mental health of black communities. Black Americans are more likely than white Americans to live in areas and housing that increase their susceptibility to climate-related health issues. And 65% of black Americans report feeling anxious about climate change's impact. Through our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity and the Office of Environmental Justice, we're working with providers and community leaders to identify innovative approaches that empower communities to address the health consequences linked to climate change. Visit hhs.gov for more information and tune in next Thursday to hear from another HHS leader on how you can contribute to advancing better health for black communities. Yeah. Just, you know, who gives a damn about the the white people or the Hispanic people who are also living within those, you know, I guess, majority black communities? It's all about color. It's all about the divide based on race. It's all about disparity equals racism. It's so ridiculous to me. I think in this argument, whether or not you agree with climate change or the science, we may get to that a little bit down the line. To focus on a group of people to help based on their race is utterly ridiculous considering if you go into said black community that Rachel Levine is supposedly saying is more directly affected by climate change you're going to find people of all different races so if anything that makes this more of a class issue than a racial racial issue but no if there's a disparity that exists because of race we have to focus on the racial element so I guess we're going to go into these neighborhoods that are being directly impacted by climate change and we're just going to help the black people (laughs) living within these communities and we're just going to leave the white ones the hispanic ones the asian ones to just go about their own business and you know go about their their day it's just i keep saying it's just ridiculous during this show but it's clown world ridiculous (laughs) there's no other words for it than clown world i thought i could not believe i'm watching this i saw a funny tweet i don't know if it was a babylon b or someone talking about the babylon b but they're like there's no way to even like satirize this kind of thing coming out of this is the White House. This is our the administrative uh, body that governs our country putting out a message like this of 
I'm sorry, an imaginary woman talking about the imaginary facts of an imaginary issue, pretty much. I mean, we can debate the, the merits of uh, these issues, the climate changes, things like that. I mean, I'm not saying it's entirely imaginary, but you get my point. It's just like the level, the lengths to which we will go uh, to emphasize intersectionality, to virtue signal, to just reinforce this woke narrative in spite of reality, in spite of more pressing, pressing issues that we're facing, um, in spite of just actual, uh, I'm not okay. I can, I'm gonna get us banned here, but anyways, um, it's I'm at a loss for words because of just the utter sheer lunacy and clown worldery that we are witnessing. I don't know what else you can do but and just we, laugh and, and cringe. We, yes, and we've really lost the plot when it comes to the whole climate change thing. And you know, my boyfriend talks about this all the time. It's not about the debate over the science of climate change or whether we're headed into a, an ice age or whether the science on that is incorrect or whether it causes you know the world to heat up or cool down or whatever. The question is, should we care about our Earth and our in environment and we're getting bogged down in fighting over climate science when the reality is of course we should care about our environment we should care about our earth we just have to decide how it is that we do that and what is the best solution to do that and it is not about race and dividing people up on like black versus white versus hispanic and yes it is something that we all should be working towards to to some degree and we have to decide what that degree is how we can do that what are ways to be sustainable it's not not about the argument of back and forth as to you know whether or not climate change is real or climate science is real we all live on earth uh, and we should probably take care of it and we should probably take care of our environment and the fact that we are like in this two-sided argument about whether or not the science is real just is irritating to say the least and it gets further entrenched in just ridiculousness when we're dividing it on the basis of race and gender and sexuality and pronouns and all this stuff. And to see a video like this, which to its logical conclusion means you're going to go into these neighborhoods and take care of the black people and no one else, just right. blows my mind. Ladies you're right. And gentlemen. You said it better than me, but it, it, betray, it betrays a level of unseriousness with regard to the actual threats that the world is facing uh, from a climate perspective, from an environmental perspective. If we're serious about these issues, then let's talk about serious solutions and serious, like scientifically based uh, advancements that we can make or technologies or things that actually move the needle on addressing the issue at hand. But to conflate this issue with the race, with gender, with all this being presented by a person who's Again, I'm I'm not going to go there, but mm -hmm. it's just like it's fundamentally unserious. And I think that's what is so irksome about uh, watching this. Yes. Uh, now, in speaking of black America, we're going to get to a story about Rachel Dolezal. Guys, she's back in the news. And I don't know how I felt about this at first. It's definitely an interesting story, although it seems like somebody was just had it out for for this woman. Rachel Dolezal, for those of you who do not recall that name, uh, is a woman who was the former leader of the NAACP who ended up resigning uh, in disgrace, as Libs of TikTok writes in this tweet, because she was pretending to be black. You'll see her face here uh, and probably remember her. She swore up and down she was African-American and turns out she's not black and she was just cosplaying blackness. Uh, now, after resigning in disgrace, it seems she went on to be uh, a teacher at a school in Tucson, whilst also posting uh, on OnlyFans pretty regularly, which we all know is a huge no-no. I'm not gonna read some of the posts that she was making on her seemingly public Facebook page about her OnlyFans content, but just know that it is interesting uh, to say the least. Now, Libs of TikTok uh, found this out in some way, shape or form, and then the school found out after this went viral on the internet and Rachel Dolezal was subsequently fired. Now, this lady 
cannot uh, cannot catch a break because she seemingly just cannot stay out of scandal and stop doing things that we know are not okay. You probably shouldn't pretend to be black. You probably shouldn't be a teacher with an OnlyFans. And now you've been caught out on both. So maybe we need to just go to towards a wholesome future or just dedicate ourselves to one lane, right? If you're gonna be an OnlyFans you know, creator and a sex worker or whatever, d do that with your whole heart or whatever sits in front of your heart, you know? Do it with all the might you have instead of maybe being a teacher on the side around little children who have access to the internet and can see your very public posts about these sexual acts that you are posting on your only fans and this is not a you know uh, a purely racial problem we've seen many a teacher get called out now on being an only fans model put that in air quotes for a reason and subsequently getting fired from the school we've even seen teachers who decide to film their only fans content on school grounds uh, sometimes with students still on campus so there's clearly an epidemic here. I don't know how much money these teachers are making from this OnlyFans content, considering the average OnlyFans model makes about $200 a month. I can't imagine it's that, uh, you know, considerate that they're going to continue to do this whilst on school grounds. But now Rachel Dolezal enters the group of teachers who have now been caught with OnlyFans accounts that they are posting on and promoting to the general public. So wild. Uh, this just clearly points out the complete degradation of our education system in just society in general, but this has happened so many times that I could make an entire YouTube documentary about teachers getting caught doing OnlyFans. I don't feel like you would have ever heard about this when I was in school in the early 2000s. This would have been a rarity. Um, and obviously, we, you didn't have the option to be an OnlyFans creator back then. So maybe this would have been what was happening had teachers had the opportunity. I'm grimacing to think of that. But it was scandalous to me to like see a teacher out in public drinking alcohol. Like you saw a teacher with a martini and you're like, oh my gosh, Miss Johnson drinks alcohol. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. And now you have teachers posting their naked photos and videos on OnlyFans for everybody to see. <laughs> Everything's fine. The world's not on fire. I mean, it feels like it is, and you're you're right. This is as much a reflection of the perhaps uh, identity issues and maybe state of mind or mental health of uh, Miss Dolezal as it is an indictment on our sex crazed culture, our race crazed culture, the state of our education system, uh, and just how detached we are from reality, from uh, norms and uh, ideals and virtues that would usually or traditionally be a bulwark against such behavior. Uh, and yet here we are. And it's unfortunate and sad and just pitiable that she finds herself in the middle of these scandals. And it, it, yeah, I think it says something about her, surely, and, and her identity issues, which were clearly evident in the prior scandal with the NAACP and the, the race faking. Um, but it also says something about just the state that we are in. And for me, I can't help but think that there's just a lack of centeredness and attachment to uh, guiding virtues, guiding uh, principles, having firm footing in reality, in uh, having a moral compass that, that works. Uh, and we're going to continue to see manifestations like this so long as we are making such a big deal out of emphasizing our differences in race, uh, we're making such a big deal out of sex positivity and all this stuff. And what what suffers? Uh, basic decency. What suffers is children's innocence. What suffers is racial harmony. What suffers is social cohesion. So as as kind of funny and slapstick knee jerk response to this story can just be like, wow, what a crazy lady. This is the world that we live in now. It really is. 
And uh, there's something very sad and alarming about that. And I think it does kind of behoove us to just take a step back and, and consider uh, where we are and whether the direction that we're going is really one that we want to continue in. Yeah, but, you know, uh, we all will have to continue on this trajectory until something happens. I don't know what. I, you know that in the wake of this story, her OnlyFans is popping. You know she's getting major hits on her OnlyFans now, so she's probably, because this story has gone so viral, made it a, a, a number one source of income for her. It's probably the smoothest transition she could have had uh, after being a teacher with an OnlyFans. And you know, I'll go as far as to say, I think a lot of young women who are in these stories of being teachers who have OnlyFans that then get exposed are angling for their OnlyFans to get exposed whilst they are teachers so they can get, you know, a New York Post article or something like that and their OnlyFans pops off. It is now widely known that a lot of major media publications that you're seeing on uh, places like X or Instagram or in your normal news feed on your phone or laptop or whatever, OnlyFans creators are paying them to write articles about them as advertisements for their OnlyFans. So you're now in this never-ending cycle of fake stuff that you're reading or very real stuff that was paid for as an advertisement that now funnels you into the uh, pornography hellscape that currently exists in our society. And I have a feeling this uh, functions, whether or not she wanted it to or not, as a huge uh, advertisement for Rachel Dolezal's OnlyFans, and I'd be curious to see uh, what her revenue stream is looking like in the wake of this coming out, because I can see a lot of people buying that, even if they didn't really want her OnlyFans, just buying it because it's funny to buy this woman's OnlyFans. It's kind of a novelty, as she is somebody who is was a major public figure in a sort of infamous way. So I bet she's making bands right now to say the least. Now, we're gonna get into some final news here. You all know that the southern border is going crazy. Millions of people entering the United States from all different places. And we were warned that this might manifest in criminality, meaning that your American citizens who are here legally are going to be impacted by people who choose to illegally come into this country and commit crimes. You saw it in New York with two police officers getting beaten down by four illegal immigrants, them being released without bail, and then one of them going on to commit an armed robbery, reoffending, and being arrested again. You now have another police officer that was violently attacked with a machete in New York City by, again, an illegal immigrant. And this is just happening over and over and over and over and over again in the city of Detroit. You have this news clip that explains that migrants are going around and stealing from neighborhoods. Homes here in the gated community at the Country Club of Detroit in Gross Point Farms. The organized burglary teams hitting here over the last weekend. And if a home backs up to trees or woods, it becomes a target. Thieves hiding there until they see their chance. Oakland County Sheriff Michael Bouchard first sounded the alarm in September after huge homes in Bloomfield Township were hit, then homes on private drives in Birmingham. The losses were in the millions. In our area, they are targeting jewelry, precious metals, high end items such as purses, um, electronics, uh, currency, high-end watches, and if there's a safe that's not attached or they can either break into on scene or carry, they'll do that. Now remember, a team was arrested and charged in Bloomfield Township with a string of car break-ins and some burglaries. But tonight, sources continue to point to what the sheriff pointed to at the very start, that other organized teams out of South America have been hitting high-end homes out west and now have made their home right here. So there you go. I mean, shocker that this is happening, that people are deciding to come into the country and start their relationship with the United States on an illegal basis and then continue to do things that are illegal? <laughs> like, so crazy to think that that might be the case. And I know the argument for many is going to be, well, United States citizens do things that are illegal. And yes, that is true. United States citizens do things that are illegal. But do we want more of that from people who are entering the country illegally and choosing to start their relationship with this country illegally? Probably not. One crime from somebody who is here on an illegal basis 
is one too many. And we're going to see more and more and more of this as millions of people are essentially funneled in uh, at our southern border from all different backgrounds, and many of them uh, strong young men who are now going to be entering this country. So I don't know what else to say. Just be on the lookout. And meanwhile, what we're deciding to do, instead of taking care of this issue, deporting people, uh, you know, creating maybe one entry point in our southern border and a huge wall as we should be creating, uh, we are paying them and giving them flights and bus tickets and aid from our government. In Chicago, they essentially gave out $17 million to black-owned restaurants, specifically black-owned restaurants, to feed illegal immigrants. So not only if you are a white restaurant owner, you don't get in on the illegal immigration $17 million feeding deal, but the $17 million is going towards feeding people who are in this country illegally, rather than people who are here in this country as legal U.S. citizens who need food. On top of that, we have a lot of recipients in the United States of SNAP, and it looks like migrants are going to get 40% more money than the average American citizen. Let's watch. Each migrant will get approximately $12.52 per day to purchase food and baby supplies. That's about 40% more than what the average low income American wow. gets in this country on government food stamps or stamps wow. in 2022, which was about $7.59 per person per day. To put in other words, that $53 million that's being used for this prepaid debit program is double what the New York State is budgeting in 2025 for its Department of Veteran Services, wow. its Office of National and Community Service, its Division of Human Rights, and it's more than each migrant will get a so. If you're an illegal immigrant coming into this country, we now have a system that funds you better than we fund Americans who are on food stamps, SNAP, EBT, all that. It funds you better than veterans, people who chose to serve this country. We're funding you guys better than cancer research and community services. Are, if we, are, is it, are we not insane? Is this not insane, guys? Now, not only are you essentially told, hey, yeah, you can come into this country where we don't even care if we get your real name or if you're identified or, you know, whose kids you have uh, along with you because we can't separate the kids from uh, the adult migrants. So come on into the country. Make sure you appear for a court date in, say, three months that they never appear for. Now we're going to incentivize it further with plane tickets and bus tickets. And we're going to give you a free food that's paid for and you can go to any black owned restaurant and, and get some food. We're going to give you further aid. You can use our healthcare system, all of these different things. If we are not actively funding the destabilization of our country, I don't know what else that would look like or how else you would describe that. That is our current reality. And it does scare me a little bit to think of what the end result of all of this is because. We've let millions of people into this country who have not assimilated to our culture, who clearly uh, do not understand or care for our laws. And this is not to say that all people who come into this country illegally are criminals, but you are to some extent because you've broken the law to come into this country. I don't mean violent criminals who are going to go on to to reoffend. That's what I'm saying. But. Guys, how does that pan out? Logically, how does that turn out for you? And do you feel good as a U.S. citizen who's in this country legally, who is paying your tax dollars on you know, an annual basis, if not more often than that, especially you know, for business owners, that your tax dollars are going towards the incentivization of people entering this country legally? How do you all feel about that? Let me know in the chat down below, because I, I can't imagine having a positive outlook on any of that. No, there's no rational way to look at these stories in the situation that we're seeing in our country right now and just not be outraged. If you have any amount of love for this country, if you have any amount of appreciation for civil rights, for physical safety, uh, there's no way just not to be incensed by what we're seeing. And I don't understand, like, how are we not at the point yet where people are marching in the streets over 
the insanity that's ensuing. Like the citizens of Detroit should be organizing and marching and demanding that their city be made safe from organized crime from South America, uh, terrorizing them at every turn. The citizens of Chicago should be organizing and demanding that their tax dollars not be given to people who have crossed into the country illegally in a way that is also discriminate discriminatory, discriminating against white business owners by mm -hmm. only funneling the money to black business owners. It's utter insanity and all around the country. My uh, my great uncle was murdered by an illegal immigrant in a drunk driving incident while he was out on his morning walk. This stuff has real consequences. And I don't understand how we've been so lulled to sleep uh, or lulled into a place where we don't believe in our agency, in the agency of our voice as citizens, of our speech, of our ability to have a government that must be responsive to us uh, in order to effect change that we want to see in our country. It seems like we don't believe in that anymore. It seems like we just are so accustomed to rolling over and taking whatever uh, horrible outcomes are being handed down to us by government bureaucrats that we feel like we have absolutely no recourse, that our voice doesn't matter, that it's powerless, or that it's all far away and it's in the hands of the politicians and oh, there's nothing that we can do. And at some point, you just have to be like, no, like, this is crazy. Yep. And that's as you're, as you're uh, listing these stories, I'm just starting to feel this rise up that like, man, we got to do something about this. I'm reading the biography of uh, Benjamin Franklin right now. And uh, during the French and Indian War or in the lead up to that in, in the 1760s, I'm sorry to get like really boring, but basically the French were uh, partnering with the Indians on the border of the colonies to terrorize the settlements that were on the outskirts of the colonies. And the, the U.S. citizens or the colonies residents were not getting uh, support from Britain to defend their uh, settlements. And they just decided, and Ben Franklin helped lead the effort in Pennsylvania, to organize a, a militia to fight against the uh, Indians and protect their land. And he was also advocating politically with Britain to try to get uh, some help uh, that was much needed. But there comes a point where you just have to like take matters into your own hands and start agitating, agonizing. I feel like the left is actually better at that, but they're out there marching for Palestine and, you know, racial justice and all this stuff and issues of much less direct consequence to their lives. Uh, when our cities are being terrorized. It's no longer unsafe. Uh, our economy is going into shambles. Our country's so sovereignty is completely uh, being violated at every turn. And, and we're just kind of like, oh, man, doesn't this suck? And I'm tired of it, man. I feel like there has to be something that we can do to start taking action and actually get off our butt and, and do something and demand that the government respond to our uh, outrage because it's I'm so tired of just being outraged on social media and not seeing any change. Yeah, I mean, and arguably the left is actually do something doing something in going out and protesting uh, in the name of Palestine because we're sending billions of dollars over to Israel to do what? So and it's crazy because we sent billions of dollars over to them and then they, that got funneled back here uh, as, as Candace recently went viral for saying for Super Bowl ads on Israel and why sh we should support Israel in whatever it is that they're doing right now. So arguably, you have people who are actually taking to the streets to call on the government to not be sending our money over there. And that is a substantial amount of money that could be used to solve the immigration problem that we are experiencing in this country, to feed Americans, to help our veterans, to fund things like cancer, cancer research. But meanwhile, you watch and we'll let's say that they were successful in getting the funding that we are sending over to Israel and Ukraine and funneling it back into the U.S. It's going to be funneled back into the U.S. to pay illegal immigrants and uh, care for their housing and their medical issues and their food when it should be helping to stop them from coming into this country as the immigration process is difficult uh, in any other country except the United States. You can just, you know, funnel right in with uh, open doors and, and open borders. And now you have people who are allowing uh, them to stay in their houses, which is just a whole nother story that we did not get into 
today. I'm over it. <laughs> Can you tell that I'm over it? I'm over seeing our money sent to places and people who do not deserve it while Americans suffer. And your money is being used to literally funnel conflicts, deaths, atrocities in other nations while Americans suffer here. Boom. I know this has just been a very like clown world complaining episode. <laughs> I actually don't care because this news needs to be talked about and discussed. And we are all paying our taxes uh, within these next few months here in the U.S. of A. And how do you feel that your money is going to feeding illegal immigrants, getting them plane tickets, uh, sending bombs into Gaza, uh, sending weapons over to Ukraine? How do you guys feel about that? Because I don't feel great about it whatsoever. In fact, I hate it. <laughs> and with that... So join us next week for our mass protest on the streets of Los Angeles, led by your own Amala Epinobi, to take it to the government. The 23-year-old girl is going to bring it all down. We'll be right there. Honestly, I'm like this close, this close to something like that happening. No, dude, you have to wonder. I'm like, um, I'm go scrolling on social media and watching videos of 12 year old girls being blown up in Gaza and wondering, wait a second, did my tax dollars go to something like that that is now being used for children getting their heads blown off in another country in a conflict that has nothing to do with the United States of America, you have to wonder uh, these things, especially with the exorbitant amount of money that we are paying that is supposedly supposed to go back to us. That is the purpose of taxes. It is to help you and yours. It is to benefit your community, not to fund whatever the hell is going on uh, in countries that have absolutely nothing to do with you and yours. And with that, we're gonna get into super chats. My goodness, got us all. Sorry guys. Riled up here. No, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, okay, let me uh, get to our first super chat from today. This is uh, Alex Lesher, or actually Daniel Santana, who's a regular thank first you, Daniel. super chatter, especially on Fridays. He just says, happy Friday. So thank you, Daniel. Always good setting the tone. Yes. And uh, we got to give you a shout out for being first. Uh, Alex Lusher says, good day, Amala and Taylor. It is my birthday today. 23 years old. Same as Amala. Oh, happy birthday. Love that for you. Hope you're having a good day. Love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. It's always so funny. Like, uh, we need to eventually write down the birthdays of regulars so they don't have to pay us money to... <laughs> acknowledge their birthday <laughs> right I get totally a calendar uh, <laughs> but no uh thank you thank you for being here and definitely happy birthday alex uh diva don says hey amal and taylor happy friday and have a good weekend taylor what are your insta and x handles so i can follow oh yeah I'm sure so so instagram i'm taylor trandall all one word t-r-a-n-d-a-h-l is my last name and on x i'm just T Trandall, T T R A N D A H L. So, yeah, give him a follow. Up. I'm more active on X, but I have fewer uh, followers, and I'm trying. Sometimes I post screenshots of my tweets that don't get any traction. On that. And Taylor spends the most time on X, so follow yeah. him on there. <laughs> so where we get like probably 80, 90 percent of the stories and stuff that we react to on the yeah, show. Good platform. So. Uh, Taylor Fan Club says Amla without makeup looks the same. She's still beautiful. It's really oh. unfair. Also, I looked up <laughs> Rachel's uh, OnlyFans. Was just curious. I swear she's kind of hot. LOL. Did more. Did see more than I want. <laughs> there you go. I told you uh, this is gonna create an influx for uh, Rachel Dolezal's page. There's no doubt about that. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, on Wednesday somebody requested we do a no makeup stream. Uh, Taylor always does a no makeup stream. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. totally. No, <laughs> so I figured yeah. I would join. Join in. Uh, and I feel like, to your credit, that's like a regular thing. Like you yeah. are without makeup fairly frequently. And it's, yeah, but it's cool that someone asked you and you just went with it. Yeah, so. I'm cool with it. We're good. 
Uh, Jimmy Mapes says, hey, Omelette Taylor, it's been a while. Love your show. I know people who have worked in Russia. Let's just say it's not perfect. You guys are great. Yeah, it's so funny because I didn't have I don't have a very big view of uh, Russian politics, the economy, what it's like to live in Russia. You guys would largely have to fill me in with the, you know, the information, you know, plus research and things like that. But it's interesting that most of the videos that are coming out are giving a very, very positive spin. And I think when Tucker was questioned as to why why, when he interviewed Vladimir Putin, he didn't get into issues of censorship, of killing your opposition, and, you know, some of these hard-hitting questions that are an indictment on his behavior. And Tucker said, well, censorship is happening in the United States, and leaders all over the world kill people. It's part of leadership, and that's why I don't want to be a leader, it's because leaders kill people. Which, sure, true, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that... Uh, Many a country has engaged in killing of opposition. I don't think the United States is an exception to that. But still, maybe a hard-hitting question uh, to ask somebody like Vladimir Putin if you're going to be sitting across from him for, you know, two or more hours and might want to hit on the idea of free speech. And, you know, it all came first full circle with what's happened with Alexei Navalny today uh, and the people who are seemingly being arrested or allegedly being arrested for mourning him in the streets. It's a big issue. Uh, one more from Taylor Fan Club says, don't worry, Taylor, you're still number one in my eyes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's all black pill to me. says, hey there, A and Tay. I like Tucker, but think all the jet fuel fumes have gone to his head because he's crazy now. Plus going after, he's going after Ben Shapiro foolishly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I would have... I share many of Tucker Carlson's criticisms. I don't think he's like the craziest person in the world. I just think some of his stuff can be a little one one noted, not as dimensional as I think it could or should be. Uh, Claire says, greetings from Germany. I finally caught you live. I love listening to your podcast. I know uh, you like to know what we do. So I'm a 23 year old technical product designer. Keep up the good work and have a nice weekend. Technical product designer. I don't even know what that means. Like, what type of technical products? Don't send another super chat. <laughs> Just yeah. let us know. I guess it's some kind of engineering. Well. Or if you have worked with, like, people who are making apps and building apps. And, like, when you're head of product, you're, mm -hmm. like, the head of the overseeing, like, the design functionality of the app and, like, what it, what it all is. So I'm guessing it's in one of those two domains. Let us know of. if that guess was correct. Yeah. Uh... Black Pill again says, I don't need a shot spotter, but do y'all know if they make a Latina trad wife spotter at all? I've been hoping to order oh, one if possible. Oh my gosh. I think they have those somewhere on the internet. I'm sure you can find all right, that's good. Latin or us <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> it's a, you can buy it at the same place you get the Gator. Sharper image. <laughs> uh, uh, Otaku69 says uh, the boondocks would kill making a skit slash episode out of what's going on in Chicago. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of The Office going on. There's South Park going on. There's boondocks going on. We're hitting all different types of comedy in our regular everyday news, which luckily we can laugh at to some extent. Uh, Joel Montero just sends a super chat. No message. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Joel. Um, Nicodemus 1984 says the statement about climate change resembles a news bulletin from American Dad or South Park. <laughs> there we go again. There you go. American Dad. Let's add that one to the list. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Again, like I said, we, we get bogged down in arguments over climate science and whether or not the graphs are realistic or whatever. The real truth is we should be taking care of our environment and we need to figure out how that is. Um, and I think we can all... Can we all agree that you shouldn't be just throwing your trash all over the earth and into the ocean and out into space and stuff like probably not. Maybe we should do something about that. Uh, and one, some someday somebody's going to hack that problem. You hope. Uh, Petra says, love your show. Greetings from the Netherlands. Oh, love that from the Netherlands. Been there once for a few days. Beautiful place. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we've got Netherlands, Germany, mm -hmm. all the prettiest languages. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Black Pill says, speaking of whatever organizations said don't have sex with your partner if they don't vote, isn't it interesting how quickly they became traditional? To some extent, I guess, yeah, it is. Uh, it's uh, somewhat of a traditional take, I guess. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. 
<laughs> I don't know. I'll have I don't to think know, about that yeah. one. If you want to go uber traditional, what if your partner is a woman and you don't believe she should vote because you're uber traditional? Wow, well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> now we're taking it back a few you decades. Know. Uh, Tareen A. Davenport says, Hey, Amelin Taylor, it's my first live show that I've caught. Party hat emoji. Hey, uh, been welcome. following you forever and enjoy your content even when I don't agree. Y'all rock. Love it. Welcome to your first ever live. Happy to have you here. Uh, Zoe Papas says, Thank you for respecting OF girls, Amala, and heart hands. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, everybody you deserves respect. Everybody. respect. You respect everybody, but yeah. you also lev levy your, your critiques yeah. uh, in an honest way. I so. have my critiques, but yeah, everybody deserves respect. So thank you for <laughs> for that. <laughs> uh, Zentangle Matilda says, Thank you for being a voice of reason in these crazy times and defending women. I loved your take on. T Taylor Swift last week too. Love your channel. Oh, thanks. Thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate all your kind words. Glad it's resonating. The Uralic Tribes says, as a Hungarian, we were invaded, occupied, colonized, enslaved, and turned into serfs for hundreds of years by Crusaders, Mongols, Turks, Austrians, Germans, etc. But we forgave and are on good terms with them. Yeah, it seems like I've never. Okay, so I'm actually going to go to Hungary. Uh, in August, it seems, the beginning of August. And I don't know much about Hungarian history, so I'm going to have to you know, look into this a little bit. But it seems like Hungary has a deep, uh, deeply held traditional values, and with that comes this sort of lack of victimhood mentality. You guys can confirm or deny that in the comments down below. I Yeah, I love it. History equals perspective. I love reading about history, mm -hmm. listening to podcasts about it. Because, um, yeah, I feel like people get very prisoner of the moment, very like make sweeping judgments on a very limited view of uh, history and uh, things make, you can have a much more humble perspective and appreciative perspective and informed perspective just by looking back. So I love that super chat, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sarah says, says, hey, Amala and Taylor, finally caught y'all live. Thank you for being the voice of sanity in a world of insanity. God bless, keep up the great work. Oh. Thank you. We try. <laughs> we try our best. I think I went off the handle a little bit in today's episode, but you know what? Gotta go yeah. with it. I didn't mean to start uh, agitating, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> That's just where I'm at. I'm at at this point, man. Yep. I don't know. Uh, Anisha says, as a non-religious person, I feel like these OnlyFans teachers could benefit from reading a holy book every now and then. See, I... I, I I would disagree, but you know what? To some some people, it helps. Uh, you know, if I, I think I was talking to Taylor the other day about uh, this new pipeline that's going to be created, and that is the OnlyFans to born again virgin pipeline. It's like when men go to prison and suddenly they're like, oh, "I believe in God and have been delivered." That's what a bunch of OnlyFans models are going to do, or they're going to go like OnlyFans to trad wife uh, once they've recognized the regret of their decision making. Now, as to the validity of that transition, you decide. But uh, I think it's going to be a major, a major transitional shift that happens for many young women in the uh, years to come. Yeah, I mean, it's I believe people can can transform and change. And um, but it, it, the degree of sincerity and depth of that transformation and change, I mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, uh, the, the proofs in, in the pudding and uh, in the fruit of your life when you make that. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, I could go on and on about that one, but we got to <laughs> get through these. It's Friday. Uh, Black Pill says, I have no problem with the border as long as the Chulas don't get deported unless her first name is Rachel and her last uh -oh, name Levine. Trump's voice, goodness. be applying. Well, I'm just going to shake my head to that You're one. You're on fire today, Alex. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Not really. Just kidding. Um, Richard Street says, uh, if the Democrats wanted to end illegal immigration, they would support border controls. If Republicans wanted to do the same, they would heavily fine any comp company or individual who employed them. Both sides are full of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's an argument to be made that uh, neither political party is doing much to solve uh, the issues. But I can at least feel that one is doing far more to perpetuate them than uh than the other indeed 
yeah, I'm sure there's lobbying that keeps Republicans or Democrats from enforcing laws in certain ways. But uh, yeah, by and large, I think we know where each one stands. Um, Richard goes on to say, agree that the U.S. should maintain its border. Illegal immigration is a form of exploitation. Oh, yeah. I mean, for all involved. For all involved. Uh, I mean, except the people who are now just directly benefiting in every way, shape, or form by coming into this country illegally and committing crimes and all that. They're just exploiting us, unfortunately. And it's a, two, it's a two-sided problem. I mean, the, the immigrants themselves are responsible for having violated the United States' sovereignty and not observed our laws and come in lawfully. Mm-hmm. Um, but the people who refuse to enforce our border laws uh, are equally responsible and the people who've created an environment that incentivizes people coming here and gives them, instead of being punished for violating our sovereignty, you're rewarded for it. So why, on the other hand, why would you not come? So it's just such right. a bleep show. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it just needs to be stopped immediately and everyone knows it. Uh, Anisha says, uh, Amala, you look gorgeous. I don't have Instagram actively living under a rock, hiding from most social media. But since I asked you to go no makeup, I changed my YouTube pic to a no makeup selfie. Ah, love that. That's awesome. Yeah, and you know what? I support your decision to not be on social media. Total green flag. Keep your life that Mm. way. You really don't need it. Uh, It's not going to bring about any bonus i don't think so keep keep on the right track that is wise i wish we didn't have to be on social media sometimes but i'm also <laughs> grateful we get to hang out with you guys and right. get to have a livelihood through right. this so you know yeah <laughs> uh don't want to don't want to hate on social media too much there of course uh celtic blacksmith says sometimes clown world is just gonna clown world i can't see it getting any better anytime soon but to each their own the geese fly home or whatever <laughs> yeah you have to Sometimes you just have to watch these things as they progress and just know what's coming next and, you know, alert people and point it out, but still kind of just watch it happen. And that kind of feels like where we're at right now. I can tell you recently, I've just been watching all the stuff that's happening in in the U.S., in the world, and just gone, you know what, we're just going to. To some extent, we are just going to watch this happen, Uh, no matter how many people like kick and scream and call their representatives and say this is not okay. It seems like the system uh, is so deeply entrenched and like these forces are just consistently moving forward that there's not much in the way of blocking the stuff that uh, is continuously happening. And that's an unfortunate feeling to have. Uh, Richard Street again says, Tucker to Hitler, how exactly did you reinvigorate the German economy? Show me the new VW plant. Nice boss uniform, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's that bad. I can get where Tucker's coming from. And I, there are some things that he's doing that I think, you know, just posing the question, I think, is an important thing to do. And he managed to do that in a lot of these videos where he says, you know what, I'm not going to give you my prescription as to what's happening. I'm just going to pose you the question and show you what I see. I just do think... Um, balancing context is really important because if you're a particularly lesser informed person who is watching these videos, you do come away with a very distinct feeling towards Russia and Vladimir. And to me, it's distinctly positive. And you could use some balancing um, and a little bit of context. Well said. Uh, Joy says, guys, I'm pulling my hair out at the state of our country. How do we get conservatives to get organized and protest like leftists do? You know what? I I think it's about finding common causes, which is unfortunate that we've managed to not be able to do that. Like, to me, it's a little dumbfounding that, like, the money that we're sending over to these other countries is not, like, a common cause that we can all get behind. Um, But I think it gets... Uh, It's sort of we find the common cause, which I think most of us can agree that we shouldn't be spending billions of dollars in foreign conflicts. And then it splinters off once we get into ideologies and people who are from different backgrounds who have different feelings about what's going on uh, when we should really focus on what is the central issue. And that is that this money should not be sent over there, point blank, period. Um, So when that will happen, I don't know. It's we're in the perfect cocktail of never getting anything done because every single issue becomes a specific side of the aisles issue. And that's 
uh, that's very, very unfortunate. Yeah, it's frustrating. My favorite idea I've heard lately is a total moratorium on foreign aid. Just completely cut everything off and then mm. like start from ground zero. Okay, do we need to pass a new one? Let's take one at a time, debate those, have our representation vote on it in a transparent way, and let's rebuild because there's so much stuff that's going on that's like, wait, we're, we've been sending money to who? Yeah. And what? Dude. And it's uh, just wildness out there and yeah like this person's talking about conservatives uniting around causes and that's true too like even conservatives can't agree like that calendar gate we did a video on that like, yeah just anything happens we find the dumbest stuff to like disunite over and just end up letting the left who even though they tend to be more wrong and misguided in the things that they advocate for they tend to also be more united and uh, forceful in their advocacy and yeah. get more done and yeah. conservatives lose ground because of that. We need to find literally common ground issues that everybody can agree on and we need to hammer them in. But when people are not willing to put down their own tribalistic tendencies and behavior in order to do so, we can all agree that the media is super corrupt, both left and right. I don't know why we're not uniting behind that. We can all agree that we shouldn't be sending this money uh, all over. Uh, I don't know why we can't all get behind that. I think we can all agree that the U.S. should not be like carrying NATO on its back. We're the like largest funder of that entire organization, while other countries who agreed to pull their weight are not pulling their weight. And as soon as somebody says something about it, i.e. Donald Trump, he's like, attacked in the media for saying something that the average American should be able to agree on, as that is your money. Uh, and unfortunately, no, we can't, because it becomes an ideological battle or a political battle or a battle over somebody's name that we don't like, rather than addressing the actual issue at heart. The amount of people Candace went viral with this whole video saying we shouldn't be sending all this money over to Israel. And the amount of people in the comments saying, like, I completely agree, but this is Candace Owens. What? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to me. Is she saying something that is correct or is she saying something that's incorrect? That is all that matters. It doesn't matter the vessel that correct information is coming from. It matters whether or not the information is correct. So with that. <laughs> Apo Rancisis says, this is why I always say we should just annex everything from Mexico to Panama. Bring America to them. Imperialism isn't inherently bad. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> We're going to have to unpack that statement at a later I, Okay, date. yeah. On a, on a philosophical level, I agree that there's that imperialism isn't always necessarily bad. Sure. But uh, I don't think that that's grounds to try to annex Mexico and Panama. I used to live in Panama. I love Panama. It's a great country. <laughs> uh, but America's got plenty of issues right now. I don't think adding more territory and peoples and trying to integrate all that would uh, go very well for us. Right. Uh, Claire again says, uh, <laughs> a technical product designer makes the plans for machinery, at least in my specialization, or for products in general. Oh, that's okay. so cool. Yeah. That sounds like a fun, like creative type job. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And at 23, that's, you're 23, 22? So I think 23. 23. That's dope. Wow. I wouldn't understand a, a word of that. I can guarantee you that right now. Yeah. Amal is, as a 23-year-old, couldn't really accomplish anything <laughs> of significance, so. <laughs> oh, uh, stop, stop. Maidlin says, don't apologize for being passionate. Take this super chat as an indication for how strongly I feel about this. Oh, Heart thank you. I appreciate it, guys. I try to keep my uh, calmness about me and talking about these issues, but lately it's been freaking overwhelming, some mm. of this stuff. Uh, Black and Mild, or BLK and Mild, says, uh, if a person is shot in the forest and shot spotters not around to hear it, was that person ever really shot? Confucius, probably. Wow. These are deep things to think about. I'm going to stroke my beard while I think about that one. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to Go venture ahead, to say yes, there, but uh, I did give that <laughs> thought. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's all black pill to me. It says, hey, I'm trying, Mr. Vic. Got to bring some levity to today's black pilled episode. Hey. Close the border, by the way. This is true. Yes, it's important to inject some levity into what you're talking about. Hopefully we had a few laughs in today's episode. So we appreciate that. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Quark says, greetings from Romania, guys. We were also oppressed and enslaved by Mongols, Hungarians, Austrians, Ottomans, Russians, but we don't ask for reparations. See, there you go. 
a lot of places have a very, very deep history and one that is riddled with oppression. I don't think you'll find a place where that does not exist. And it's all about how you uh, view it. And that's not to say that reparations are never the answer or something like that. Uh, it's just to say that, come on, yeah, we not everything requires that response. Indeed. If your whole worldview is based on this myopic focus view on a specific historic injustice, <laughs> you're uh, holding yourself back and the world back and your people back. You gotta move on.com at some point. Yep. Uh, Celtic Blacksmith says, so Amala, how's that PO box going, darling? I'll make you a deal. I'll launch my Rumble channel with a video of your gift being made when you get your PO <laughs> box so set up. That way I'm uh -huh. held accountable too. Fair enough. I just went to the post office and I got the paperwork. It was very long. Uh, so I have the paperwork. I just have to fill it out and bring it back. So we are step one. Check. <laughs> okay. So we've actually made progress, there. guys. One foot in front of the other. We have made progress. Yes. <laughs> And yeah, leave it to California to make it super complicated Dude. to get a stinking P.O. box. Just like trying to pick which size box you want is like t 10 pages of oh paper. It's like crazy. Uh, well, that was our last super chat. So we made it through another week in Clown World, guys. Everyone yes, pat yourself did. on the back. Appreciate well you guys. Thank you for being on here. Actually, Richard Street just said, just join Patreon. Finally paying my way, guys. Uh, I am going to release a song on Patreon tomorrow. It's not fully original. It's a, a song that was already created that is rewritten uh, with my lyrics for what I'm thinking about today. And that'll release on Patreon on a Saturday. And then maybe on YouTube and other platforms uh, a day or two after that. Be on the lookout. So thank you to everybody who signed up to be a, a patron on Patreon and supported the work that we do on this channel. Uh, you really do keep us going and allow us to do what we want to do as we do not do those host read ad reads on this show because I don't want to be wasting your time and give you stuff that you have to skip through on YouTube. And uh, yeah, we try to stay away from that as much as we possibly can. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Let me know how you felt about all the different stories we covered in the comments down below. As always, if you disagree with me, duke it out, but do so respectfully. And if you like this video, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we're live. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Plus, we post videos for you guys every day. Tomorrow's video is about Sean Evans, host of Hot Ones with hot questions, but even hotter wings. And uh, the fact that he started dating a P-star and maybe couldn't handle that that was, in fact, her occupation when the public found out. We will discuss that. We're, we're staying on the OnlyFans track, I guess, <laughs> over the next couple of days. Keep an eye out for that. And guys, with that, I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and I will see you tomorrow. Real quick, let me read Brock's Super oh, Chat. Sure. Buzzer. Go for it. For Fool's Day, you should harness your former leftist energy and cover all your topics thoroughly through that lens. <laughs> Maybe we will try that. I can put a leftist hat on for a day or so and we can uh, figure it out. I'll, I will keep that idea in mind. Thank you for that Super Chat at the buzzer. And guys, have a fantastic weekend.